Okay, everybody, welcome back to our second presentation today. This is from uh, Professor David Sloan Wilson. So the talk is going to be on conscious evolution and society as an organism. And David is one of the, the world's foremost evolutionary thinkers and a gifted communicator about evolution to the general public. He's a SUNY Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Biology and Anthropology at Binghamton University in New York. In addition to his teaching and research work, David is president of Pro Social World, an organization which aims to catalyze positive cultural change to consciously evolve who we are, how we connect with each other, and how we interact with the planet. He is passionate about making evolutionary science more accessible to a wider audience. And in 2019, he was invited to speak with the Dalai Lama about his work. David is the author of several books on evolutionary theory, including Atlas Hugged, his first novel, This View of Life, Evolution for Everyone, Darwin's Cathedral, Does Altru Altruism Exist?, and the co-author of Pro Social, along with Paul Atkins and Stephen Hayes. You can learn more about his work at www.darwinianrevolution.com and follow him on Twitter at David underscore S underscore Wilson. This is David's second talk with us, and I'm sure you'll agree it's a delight to have him back. So David, whenever you're ready, just get started and we'll get going. Okay, well, thank you, Niall. And um, hello, everybody. Please to spend the next two, uh, two hours um, uh, with you. And so uh, this image here is uh, from a woman uh, recently deceased, a beloved woman named Barbara Marks Hubbard, who is one of the uh, spiritual thinkers who uh, thinks about conscious evolution um, from a, a spiritual uh, perspective. And as uh, Niall just said, I had the uh, wonderful honor of having a one hour conversation with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. I um, shared that honor with um, uh, Pumla Gabodo Matakazela, who is a social scientist, is influential in the uh, South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. We each spent an hour with uh, His Holiness. This was organized by the Mind and Life um, Institute. And um, uh, that took place in 2019, but uh, very recently uh, it has resulted in a uh, video that was released in honor of His Holiness's birthday and a longer podcast, which are beautifully produced. And in my mind, maybe the best way for you to learn about what all of this is about. So uh, I hope that we have a great time during our time together. But uh, also, if you want to learn more, then I highly recommend this video and especially the podcast, because of course, the, the video and my, my one hour with His Holiness could only scratch the surface. And the one hour, the podcast, uh, enabled me to take a deeper dive into the same uh, issues. So my message to His Holiness was, very briefly, that when I entered the field of evolutionary biology way back in the 1970s, uh, the field of evolution was very largely confined to the study of genetic evolution. It was framed almost entirely in terms of selfishness, individual self-interest in their selfish genes. And evolution was emphatically said to have no purpose. Um, organisms just vary without regard to what's selected and the immediate environment does the selecting. There is no other purpose to evolution than that. And so this provides very little scope for basically relating evolutionary theory to everything that His Holiness represents in terms of Buddhism, compassion, and in ethics for the whole world. Uh, but then I continued <clears throat> during my time as an evolutionary biologist, the transformation has occurred. Evolution now is used to study both cu uh, cultural and personal evolution in addition to genetic evolution, as I will get to. Uh, <clears throat> it can explain the evolution of goodness, everything we associate with goodness, compassion, and virtue at face value. And evolution can be consciously directed and needs to become more so. And so this is like going from sailing against the wind to sailing with the wind. This new view of evolution is far more favorable to the worldview of His Holiness, uh, which is based on the ancient tradition of Buddhism and now being applied uh, for the welfare of the whole world. And that point actually bears commenting upon that um, really, uh, the whole concept that we need to be citizens of the world, we're first and foremost human beings and citizens of the world, was beyond the imagination until 
the 19th century even. Before that, it was my nation, my religion. Uh, you know, we had the Crusades. Even Buddhism was less pacifistic than you might than you might uh, than you might think. But now, all religious leaders are basically um, arguing for an ethics for the whole world. As the Dalai Lama here is, he says he never loses the opportunity to say, you know, there's seven billion people in this world, and one billion aren't religious at all. So we have to reach them too. And and uh, the Pope, of course, has encyclical our common home. So the idea that the earth is the group, the primary group, has gone from being unimaginable to being the only thing that makes sense based on everything taking place, such as this meeting where I'm talking with you around the world as if you were by my, as if you were by my side. So what I want to do today is I want to first spend a little bit of time talking about the deep roots of these ideas, which go all the way back to antiquity. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and then I want to talk about what I like to call the great constriction in my field of evolutionary biology when I entered the field. Then get to the new paradigm. That I hope to cover all of that in our first session. And then in the second session, I want to focus on how do we make this happen in the real world? How do we consciously evolve a global superorganism, to put it very, to put it very simply? So that's um, that's a lot on our plate. <laughs> so I hope I don't overwhelm you. I sometimes think that whenever I talk, I'm forcing people to enter a hot dog eating contest. But uh, here we go. The um, idea of society as a organism uh, goes back all the way to the beginning of recorded uh, thought, uh, deeply embedded in in both religious and uh, and political. Uh, uh, thought we see it in images such as the famous cover of Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, and of course the body of the church united under the head of of uh, Christ, and by scholars such as Emil Durkheim, one of the fathers of the social sciences, one of the pioneers of the social uh, sciences, and um, a psychologist at Harvard named Daniel Wegner had this to say about this this tradition of thinking of society as an organism. Almost every early social theorist we now recognize as a contributor to modern social psychology held a similar view. That's how pervasive it was to think of, of um, a society as an organism in its own right. But if this sounds unfamiliar to you today, it's because it's been eclipsed by the intellectual tradition of individualism, which also has long roots, but became the dominant intellectual tradition in Western societies at least for the last, I would say 70 years since shortly after World War II. And another social scientist, Donald, Donald Campbell, wrote, this is the dogma that all human social group processes are to be explained by laws of individual behavior, that groups and social organizations have no ontological reality, that where used references to organizations, et cetera, are but convenient summaries of individual behavior. So if you're not explaining social phenomena in terms of individual thought and action, you don't understand it well enough. Individualism takes diverse forms that are not necessarily that well coordinated with each other. In economics, it takes the form of the rational actor model in neoclassical economics. In the social sciences, it's called methodological individualism, as if we can justify it on the basis of its practical utility, uh, regardless of its philosophical underpinnings. And in my field of evolutionary biology, when I entered the field, it takes the form of the theory of individual selection and of course, Richard Dawkins' concept of the selfish gene. And I can never, never uh, talk about this without, without the Margaret Thatcher meme that everyone's heard a million times. There is no such thing as society. There are individual men and women and there are uh, uh, families and <laughs> brought to us by the Atlas Society. So back to Ayn Rand. Uh, now, here's just a, a taste of what I encountered when I entered the field, individualism and evolutionary biology, a quote by a very famous uh, scientist at the time, Richard Alexander, in a book titled The Biology of Moral Systems. So he's attempting to explain the nature 
of morality from an evolutionary perspective. And he writes, I suspect that nearly all humans believe it is a normal part of the functioning of every human individual now and then to assist someone else in the realization of that person's own interests to the actual net expense of those of the altruist. What this greatest intellectual revolution of the century tells us is that despite our intuition, there is not a shred of evidence to support this view of beneficence and a great deal of convincing theory suggests that any such view will eventually be judged false. So this was the triumphalism that I encountered as a graduate student and I made my reputation by opposing it. And looking back, I think I can see it, I think we can all see it as very similar to the triumphalism of economics, which also boasted about being, you know, set apart from the social sciences by its wonderful um, authoritative, austere uh, theoretical framework of rational, uh, rational choice theory. So we're looking back, we can see this triumphalism as really a provincial view, the provincial view of uh, individualism. So why did, why did this sea change occur? It, it occurred for a reason. And uh, one problem with uh, the society as an organism concept, group level functionalism, is that it was axiomatic about society as a unit of functional organization. It was simply assumed that society is functionally organized and it was the job of the social scientist to figure out the functions of this feature or that feature. It did not have a strong explanation for how societies got that way, certainly not an evolutionary explanation or the role of individual agency. And so it was a little bit easy to attack on those grounds. And also the idea that all things are social or carried out by individuals seems as if it can't be otherwise. Who else would carry out anything that we would call social? So superficially there's, there's power to the idea that we need to understand all things social. Um, um, in terms of individual thought and uh, and uh, action. I'd also like to point out something else, which is um, I think non-ideological, which is that for the study of any important topic, there appears to be a life cycle, which begins of course with verbal models, especially since mathematics itself did not develop until you know the 17th and 18th um, of centuries. We begin by describing things in words. And we begin by theorizing in words. And at that level, it's easy to appreciate complexity. So we might you know, wax poetic about the vast tapestry of nature, for example, or the complexity of human society. But then comes formal mathematical models, which are so very powerful. And just imagine how Newton stunned the world by being able to predict the orbits of the planet, planets with such precision. And so the power of mathematics to make inferences on the basis of its assumptions is absolutely amazing. And I'm not here to deny it. But nevertheless, in order to build a mathematical model, I know because I'm a theoretical biologist, and I'll bet there are some people in this audience that also have built mathematical models, you have to make so many simplifying assumptions, so many simplifying assumptions. And so that results in a de facto denial of complexity. And so these mathematical models have their insights, but also prove their limitations. And then stage three is to go beyond them. But the only way to go beyond them, short of returning to verbal models, is with computer simulations. And those computer simulations weren't available until the closing decades of the 20th century, the so-called sciences of complexity. And so for that reason alone, the availability of, of widespread computing power, understanding complexity is, is that recent. And so uh, all fields of inquiry appear to undergo this life cycle. And I have a um, example of this. Oh dear, my GIFs aren't working. Now, is there any way to make these work? Because they're so cool. Um, they work on my PowerPoint, but um, I can describe them in words. But uh, on the left, what you see is a simple pendulum. And it just swings back and forth, back and forth. And of course, that could be modeled mathematically. On the right, we have a jointed pendulum. You see there's a joint in the middle. 
so that the second length can swing independently of the first length. And as the jointed pendulum swings back and forth, which you can see on the GIF, just look it up on the internet, it traces, as you begin to see here, this, this trajectory, which is just so uh, amazing in its unpredictability. It just goes swooping this way and that. And every time you do it, it'll trace a different picture. So that's the what happens when you go from a relatively simple system, such as a pendulum, which you can math, model mathematically, to even something as simple as a single jointed pendulum. It's still a purely physical system, but that com complex behavior that results. And so one way that individualism is giving way uh, has had its day, I think, um, and we're leaving uh, individualism is, is just this kind of complex systems thinking and the tools to be able to apprehend it, even before we get to evolutionary theory. And then there's a lot more that is specifically evolutionary. Okay, so those are the deep roots of the superorganism concept. And now uh, just a little bit about the deep roots of the concept of evolution as a conscious process. We have to remember that Darwin was not the only evolutionary thinker. He was preceded by others, especially people like Herbert Spencer and John Baptiste Lamarck, who did not grasp the idea of natural selection. And so their view of evolution, which was one which was progressive and could be consciously steered. A lot of this was part of the humanist movement and the desire to create a body of thought that could function like a religion um, and uh, without invoking supernatural agency. So the science of man or the religion of man as uh, Auguste Comte uh, uh, put it. And so the whole concept of evolution was constructed as a way to basically think about humanity and humanity altering its, its course. Uh, the word evolution is derived from the same word for development. And so it was regarded as a kind of an unfolding as opposed to the more blind process of variation and selection, which was Darwin's great uh, insight. Darwin himself was more Lamarckian than we think often. That's only in retrospect that we try to make a big division between Darwin and uh, uh, Lamarck, so on and and uh, and so forth. Darwin, of course, he knew nothing about genes, so he framed his theory in terms of variation, selection, and heredity without knowing anything about the mechanisms of heredity. So he tended to think about human cultural evolution along with biological evolution. Those divisions were all in the future. And so conscious evolution has deep roots, just like um, uh, dating all the way back to the origin of the term, um, along with the concept of, uh, of um, superorganisms. And so the great constriction began when basically Mendel's work, Mendel was a contemporary of Darwin, but his, the, the significance of his work was not appreciated until the early 20th century, it led to the science of genetics, Mendelian genetics. And it was then that the study of evolution became narrowly focused on Mendelian genetic evolution. And then with the discovery of DNA in the 1950s, then that became molecular um, uh, genetics. And, um, and so it was there that we got this insistence that organisms vary at random, anything that takes place during the life of an organism is not transmitted to its germ cells, only the immediate environment does the selecting and no other purpose or direction to um, evolution. And the study of cultural evolution was simply relegated to other disciplines, anthropology, uh, sociology, and many of those disciplines developed uh, separately into sophisticated bodies of knowledge, but uh, without much connection to evolution and very often in perceived opposition to evolution. Evolution was branded as being genetically determinist and indeed it was. And so we get this apartheid basically between the study of human cultural evolution and genetic evolution. That's represented here by this mosaic tile. This is actually part of a new science building at the University of Notre Dame. And what we see around the edge is the famous 
phrase by Theodosius Dobzhansky, the geneticist, who said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And what you see in, in the middle is the double helix, as if biology is just genes. So around the world, if you say the word evolution, people hear the word genes. And this, I think, deserves to be called the great constriction. So here's the new paradigm. Uh, evolutionists such as uh, Eva de Blanca and Miriam Lamb here, and this is one of the great books on the topic, I'll be illustrating <coughs> with some of the key books uh, on the topic. Um, so evolutionists have gone back to basics and they've, they've defined Darwinian evolution, Darwin's key insight, as any process that includes the three ingredients of variation, selection, and replication. Things vary in just about everything you can measure. Those differences make a difference in terms of survival and reproduction. And those differences tend to replicate over time. And then all of the conclusions of evolution flow from those three simple ingredients. And as soon as we generalize Darwinism in that way, we can immediately see that genes are only one mechanism of inheritance. Other mechanisms include epigenetics, changes in the expression of genes as opposed to the presence and absence of genes, forms of social learning found in many species, and forms of symbolic thought that are distinctively human. And one of the parts of this new paradigm is that although there's such a strong tendency to call our species unique compared to other species, and for the most part, those efforts are just flat out wrong you know i mean there's other species use tool other species do this and and um and that and then and other species are smarter than we are and what they do what they've evolved to do well but it does appear that our capacity for symbolic thought is a distinctive form of mentality and why that should be is something that i will quickly uh get to and of course we have evolutionary computer algorithms artificial intelligence algorithms which rely on variation, selection, and replication processes at lightning speed and has become a big part of our uh, big part of our world. We tend to think of evolution as something that takes place across generations, but it can also take place within generations. And we all know about the adaptive component of the immune system. Our body has actually, there's two components of the immune system. One's called innate, very sophisticated, but does not change during our lifetimes. And then adaptive, the rapid variation and selection of antibodies on the basis of their ability to bind to antigens. And so the immune system, adaptive component of the immune system is a Darwinian process taking place during our lifetimes. And so also is our open-ended ability for behavioral learning, what B.F. Skinner called selection by consequences. Um, many organisms behave every which way, and then they're endowed by genetic evolution with what's called reinforcers that cause them to, to basically uh, do the things that are rewarding and not to do the things that are punishing. And so, in fact, you can get a lot of insight of thinking of our behavioral system, our open-ended behavioral system, as like our immune system with both an innate and an adaptive component. And then the more we understand organisms mechanistically, and especially how they develop, then we see Darwinian processes going on at the mechanistic level, such as the selection of neurons competing for attachment sites and things like that, so that, uh, so that we can think of brain development and other aspects of our development as a Darwinian process in a mechanistic sense. And here's an early book on, uh, on that uh, 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 topic. So the bottom line and the main message of my book, This View of Life, is that we have a theory that has proven itself for the study of genetic evolution and in its major elements can be applied to all the fast-paced changes taking place around us, that would be cultural evolution, and within us, our personal evolution. And so if you take that phrase, nothing in X makes sense except in the light of evolution, we can use the words human, culture, and policy in addition to the word biology. So this is the new paradigm 
and it's only oh i mean everything has roots but you know for the most part most of the relevant developments are 20 and 30 years old and in my experience they're unknown by even the most progressive and widely read thinkers are usually newly encountering this uh this uh, uh material okay and let me do a quick time check and now i'm going to this the next section of uh, of my talk is going to talk about functional analysis how do we study things that have functions because function of course is the dividing line between a living process and a non-living process organisms have functions and and the and the um extensions of organisms have have um, uh, uh, functions non-living processes can be very complex like this snowflake but a snowflake does not have a function it might have aesthetic beauty for us we might endow it with a function but by itself it has no function and if something is functionally organized whether it's an organism or a tool a human-made machine even an animal made structure such as a beaver dam or a, a bird's nest um, it demands a certain way of studying it functional analysis demands a certain form of um, analysis and we and it begins with recognizing the the unit that's functionally organized in the case of the fruit fly it is the the fly is the functionally organized unit. It's designed by natural selection to survive and reproduce in its environment. It's a solitary insect, which I'm about to elaborate upon. And so if you were to study the fruit fly, everything below the level of the fly, its cells, organs, ultimately its molecules, you would analyze in terms of its contribution to the functioning of the whole. And everything above the level of the organism, that would be populations of flies and ecosystems containing flies, you would analyze in terms of populations of agents following their respective adaptive strategies, a different way than what's below the fly. And so here it is again, we have the fly below it, we have organ cells, molecules above it, we have populations, and ecosystems, and it's necessary. They're all complex systems, and you could even call them complex adaptive systems, but we need to distinguish two meanings. And this is something, by the way, which is really new among complex systems theorists. This is not common knowledge among complex systems theorists. So this is a very important point that's still being clarified at the, at the, at the top level of, uh, of uh, experts. Uh, so, the first meaning of complex adaptive systems is a complex system that is adaptive as a system. We'll call that CAS1. A fruit fly is a system that is adaptive as a system. The second meaning is a complex system composed of agents following their respective adaptive strategies. That's, we call that CAS2. And that would be a population of flies or ecosystems containing flies. And the big take home message is is that CAS2 systems do not robustly self-organize into CAS1 systems. Special conditions are required for a complex system to become adaptive as a system. Something that is merely CAS2, a system of agents following their respective adaptive strategies, does not robustly self-organize into a CAS1 system without those special conditions and this is such an important point to make because it's very common <laughs> very common in the past and to a degree in the present to think that nature by itself strikes some kind of harmony so populations and ecosystems for example uh, strike some kind of of uh, harmonious balance um, uh, just left to their own devices and so it's very important to emphasize that this is not the case. I'll do this with, with a, a series of examples. So uh, of course, natural selection will, will um, uh, cause fruit flies to evolve higher and higher reproductive rates. That can very easily create chaotic population dynamics, basically destabilize population dynamics. Infanticide is common in so many social 
species. Adults kill the babies of others to have their own babies. That's straightforwardly understood as adaptive for the adults, for the infanticidal adults, not good for the mothers, not good for the babies, not good for the group, not good for the species, just good for the infanticidal individual, which can be males or females, by the way. In migratory bird species, females offer suffer higher mortality. Why? Because males are bigger than them. They claim the best habitats and they force the females into um, marginal uh, habitats. That's good for the males. And don't seek any other kind of explanation. Not good for the females, not good for the population. This is the sense in which something which is adaptive for an individual ends up being disruptive and maladaptive at the at higher levels. Our beaver ecosystems are wonderful and diverse. I live among them. I live in a very marshy um, um, uh, place. But if you want to understand a beaver ecosystem, look to beavers maximizing their own fitness. And then just about everything else is a collateral effect of that. It's not doesn't result in a well-functioning ecosystem or anything like that. And so I've given natural examples. <coughs> But of course, there's an infinite number of human examples. Look at any soap opera, look at Game of Thrones, look at any drama, and you'll find people pursuing their various strategies at odds with each other. And so that's the difference between a system that's adaptive as a system and a system that is um, merely composed of agents following their respective adaptive strategies. That there could not be a more important distinction because when we become policymakers, when we try to actually manage cultural evolution in the real world, of course, it's all about creating CAS1 systems. We need our systems to function well as systems. If they're CAS2 systems, then that's what's causing our problems. So the whole essence of managing cultural evolution requires knowing and implementing the special conditions for CAS1 systems to um, evolve. Now, so far, everything that I've said would seem to validate individualism because I've, I've said here that the individual fly is this anchor of analysis which dictates everything, the way we study everything both below and above, although in, in different ways. But the next point is, is that it is not always the case that the individual is the unit of functional organization. Here I've listed four units of functional organization. Above the fly here, we have a social insect colony, a honeybee colony. And if you were to study honeybees, in some sense, the single bee would, be, would remain a unit of functional analysis in very important ways, but so would the colony. So would the colony. And so you would be analyzing the colony as a unit of functional organization. Um, um, in the same way that I discussed the the um, the uh, individual fly and the individual bee would be more like a cell or a neuron or an organ or would be basically playing its role in the context of the of the colony in a way that has no counterpart for the individual fruit fly, a solitary species. We can go down still further and we can study cancer. And Cancer is nothing more or less than natural selection taking place among the cells within our bodies. Our bodies become the population and cells that manage to proliferate compared to neighboring cells are adaptive in the evolutionary sense of the word. So now the cancer becomes the organism. We, we analyze the cancer as the unit of functional organization. And then the individual the multicellular organism has become a CAS2 system, not a CAS1 system. And then at the top, we have our microbiomes, ecosystems of many trillions of, of uh, microbes, many thousands of species. But because our microbiomes are selected along with our genes when we live and die, our microbiomes are living and dying in addition to our genes, then dang, if that ecosystem doesn't actually become functionally organized in the same way as we might analyze a fruit fly, a cancer cell, or a social insect colony. So my points about CAS1 and 2 systems 
apply to units of functional organization, which can be individual organisms, but need not be. And that's why this multi-level view is such a, an amazing departure from individualism, which is axiomatic about the individual as the unit of functional organization. So to wrap up here, <clears throat> we have functional analysis must be anchored on the units of selection. Units of selection must be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. They're not axiomatically even either groups or individuals. And then I'm tossing in a lot of other stuff here, mindful that I'm probably, uh, again, uh, providing too much information, that when you're an evolutionist, you know that um, uh, not everything is adaptive. Many traits result in byproducts. There's such a thing as drift, differences that don't make differences. Traits are often parts of larger developmental systems. You can't analyze them um, atomistically. Uh, we have uh, problems with mismatches. Um, traits that evolved in the context of one environment can become maladaptive in the context of a changed environment. So this is the whole evolutionary toolkit, basically, that's part of the new paradigm. And I cover these more in my book, This View of Life. So I'm kind of cherry picking elements of this uh, of this um, evolutionary toolkit for the purposes of this uh, of this uh, talk. Now, to say a little bit more about the revival of multi-level selection, um, I've already said that this uh, triumphalism with which it was rejected can be seen as the triumphalism of individualism. And now, when we look back upon it, uh, multi-level selection theory is so elementary and essential that it needs to be seen as an addendum to Darwin's theory of natural uh, selection and in order to explain the evolution of pro-social behaviors. And I like to convey this with uh, the game of Monopoly. So and this is a game where it's played by a single group and the groups are in competition with each other. It's a matter of within group competition, pure and simple. There's almost no context for cooperation in a game of Monopoly. The main context is when somebody is winning, the other players gang up on them, they cooperate briefly, only to compete among themselves for the final winner. And so the context for cooperation is almost non-existent in a single game of Monopoly. So now imagine a Monopoly tournament in which the trophy goes to the team that collectively develops its, its, its properties the fastest, okay? So imagine playing that game. And now your competitors around the board have now become your teammates. And we now have a very strong, in fact, an overwhelming context for cooperation within the group in order to compete against other groups. The unit of selection and the unit of competition has gone from individuals compared to other individuals within the group compared to groups, compared to other groups in some kind of multi-group population. And of course, there's almost no context for cooperation among the teams. <laughs> and so, so it's so easy to establish this. For that, we need to have some kind of tournament of groups of groups, and we could. So when we establish this intuition, we can say that basically evolution is like this. Evolution takes place at multiple scales, often simultaneously. And the evolution that takes place at the smallest scale among individuals within groups is like the single game of Monopoly. There's a huge evolutionary force operating at the smallest scales that favors selfish, non-prosocial behaviors. And that's why we see so many of them in nature, such as in fantasy. <coughs> When natural selection <clears throat> takes place between groups, it's like the Monopoly tournament. It results in teamwork, of course, but only at that scale. So the point is teamwork does not come for free. Special conditions are required. That's the point I made when I said that a complex system that functions as a system, adaptive as a system, requires special conditions. Those conditions are, it must be the unit of selection. It must be the unit of selection. Otherwise, we just end up with CAS2 systems. Here's a real world example. And this actually, this is the example that I, I use with his holiness. 
And there's a wonderful am animation on the video that uh, goes through this uh, example. So imagine we're trying to breed productivity in hens, um, a better breed of egg layer. Um, the, the hens live in groups. Nowadays, they're housed in cages. In the first experiment, we select the best individual egg layer within each group. And in the second experiment, we select the best group of egg layers. And so the results, hopefully this is intuitive for you, that first experiment is like the game of Monopoly. You select the biggest bully within each group. When you select the best egg layer, you select the, the hen that suppressed the productivity of other hens. And in five generations, you produce this strain of murderous hens um, that, as I put it to his holiness, are all imposing suffering on each other. The second experiment is like the Monopoly tournament. You're selecting the most cooperative hens, and these hens, as I told His Holiness, are on the path to enlightenment. So it's so simple. And the idea that it could have been rejected as strongly as it was during the age of individualism, I think we could look back upon that in retrospect, really in a kind of a wonder as to how something as simple and fundamental as this could have been rejected with such, with such um, uh, zeal. And so we can stretch this out, and we must in human life, because human life consists of groups within groups within groups. And so in plain English, we can say, and again, this is deeply intuitive, what's good for me can be bad for my family. What's good for my family can be bad for my clan. What's good for my clan can be bad for my nation. What's good for my corporation can be bad for the economy. Nations trying to grow their economy can be bad for the planet. Get it? And this is the opposite of the invisible hand concept in economics, which pretends that we can just go about pursuing our lower level interests. And then somehow, as if led by an invisible hand, this will turn out for the common good. That's true only in the narrowest of contexts. And there is more to say about that, but that's all I'll say at this moment. Now, I'm mindful of the time here. I'm gonna to stick to our schedule of taking a break at, uh, at the 45 minute mark. Um, uh, a part of this is called major evolutionary transitions that the balance between levels of selection within versus between group selection is not static, but can itself evolve. And so when we have mechanisms that suppress within group selection, then between group selection becomes the main evolutionary force. And when this happens, the group becomes so functionally organized that it becomes a higher level organism. Everything we call an organism, in fact, did not evolve just by small mutational steps from other individuals, from other organisms, that too, of course, but originated as social groups that became so cooperative that now we call them an organism. And so the concept of organism and the concept of of organism as society and society as an organism have truly merged as part of this new new uh, paradigm. The concept of society as an organism stands on a vastly stronger scientific foundation than it ever did before and explains why us humans are so different than other primates. In most primate societies, including chimps, you see a little cooperation and a lot of what we see here within group conflict. They're playing the single game of Monopoly. And humans are great at playing in Monopoly tournaments, typically at the small group level. And so here are two great books on this. I'm trying to finish up by my uh, time here. Um, by um, And it gets back to the... To the uh, to the nature of, mor of morality, the correct view of morality compared to, to uh, Alexander's individualistic view is it's, it's, it's like an immune system, basically, for, for protecting against path pathological behaviors as opposed to path pathogen uh, organisms. So in a strong moral community, there's a strong sense of what's right to do, and there is protections against deviant behavior. There is, a, there is a compulsory aspect of moral systems in addition to a voluntary aspect. We want to help others and at the same time, we punish others for not 
adhering to our norms. And so this provides a new view for human um, uh, morality. Now, Niall, shall we stop here now and uh, have our break? Okay, so we're talking about human morality as very much a matter of social um, control. <laughs> and um, I wanted to read a passage from a book that I'm reading now. It's called Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World by Tyson uh, Yunkaporta, who is an Australian Aborigine who is very familiar with both his own culture and the modern world. So he's trying to explain indigenous thought to a modern uh, Western audience. And uh, so I'm gonna read a little bit of this. Why? Because it is so affirmative of what I just said. And I love reading this book because it just affirms what we've come to scientifically from someone who's actually uh, um, um, uh, a product of a indigenous, uh, primarily hunter-gatherer, uh, culture. And he's talking about the emu in folklore, in, in Aboriginal folklore. The emu is the, bear, the, the big land bird. So uh, he says, emu is a troublemaker who brings into being the most destructive idea in existence. I am greater than you. You are less than me. This is the source of all human misery. Aboriginal society was designed over thousands of years to deal with this problem. Some people are just idiots and everyone has a bit of idiot in them from time to time, coming from some deep place inside that whispers, you are special, you are greater than other people and things, you are more important than everything and everyone, all things and all people exist to serve you. This behavior needs massive checks and balances to contain the damage it can do. And so isn't it wonderful? That just affirms completely what I'm trying to say as a, scientist and he continues with a, a folk tale. It says, my favorite one tells the story of a meeting in which all the species sat down for a yarn to decide which would be the custodial species for all of creation. Emu made a hell of a mess, running around, showing off his speed and claiming his superiority, demanding to be boss and shouting over everyone. You can see the dark shape of Emu in the Milky Way. Kangaroo, his head is the Southern Cross, is holding him down. Echidna is grasp grasping him from behind, and the great serpent is coiled around his legs. Containing the excesses of malignant narcissists is a team effort. <laughs> and so I think that's such a wonderful affirmation of the need, the original sin of human society is to push yourself around basically and to regard yourself as superior to other um, people. And so thanks to our ability to do this, we, every, everything distinctive about our species is a form of cooperation, including our minds. And so the reason that we're so distinctive in our capacity for symbolic thought is because symbolic thought is inherently a cooperative enterprise. It could not evolve if members of groups were not in trustworthy relations. And so this has led to what's something called dual inheritance theory, which basically says that there's two streams of inheritance in our species. Uh, each of you is a collection of genes. We call that your genotype. And those genes influence just about anything that could be measured about you. We call that your phenotype. Each of you is also a collection of symbols. We'll call that your symbotype. And that symbotype interacts with your genotype to also influence just about everything that could be measured about you, that very same phenotype. And so this idea that of thinking of our symbolic systems, our narratives, our stories, our theories, as literally like our genes, is very powerful metaphorically, among other things, for us to think about how we can actually change our symbotypes, our symbolic systems, in order to adapt ourselves to our environments. And so some of the great people working on this is Joseph Henrik at Harvard University, his two books on cultural evolution. A uh, part of this is the recognition that uh, uh, WEIRD stands for Western Educated industrial, rich, and democratic. 
that those societies are very peculiar, basically, compared to worldwide cultural diversity, but because the vast majority of science and scholarship takes place in weird societies, simply we just are only beginning to learn about the true nature of cultural diversity outside our own cultural bubble. So, uh, and then we have Peter Turchin in, uh, um, interpreting human history from an evolutionary perspective, not only the last 10,000 years of history in ultra society, but the American history, the last 300 years of American history in his book, Ages of Discord. So this is the sense in which this new paradigm is being used across, um, across um, um, uh, disciplines. So in retrospect, just as in retrospect, multi-level selection theory is, uh, is and should be obvious, the idea of conscious evolution uh, in retrospect is completely obvious. The idea that it does not have a conscious component only makes sense in the, the narrowest of contexts. Darwin, of course, talked about artificial selection in, in order to explain natural selection. With artificial selection, the target of selection is consciously chosen by people, but it's still an evolutionary process. Among other species, sexual and social selection, species are selecting the traits of other members of their species. And the idea that, that the reason that we're so cooperative is because we did to ourselves essentially the same thing we did to our domesticated plants and animals called self-domestication has become a hot, hot um, um, a topic. The idea that when there's more than one evolutionary process, the faster process, which would be individual learning and and cultural evolution, in fact, becomes the leading force in the genetic evolution follows where individual learning and, and cultural evolution leads is an idea which is actually quite, quite um, old. And as soon as we begin thinking of human cultural evolution, um, it uh, just manifestly has a conscious component. So these things are all obvious in in uh, retrospect, throughout history, we've imagined our worlds and attempted to bring them about. There's one example. Uh, here's a conversation I had with a Greek scholar, Uzziah Ober at uh, Stanford uh, University. And, oh my heavens, to think about the history of ancient Greece from this perspective. I mean, ancient Greece consisted of hundreds of city-states on islands. So there's your multi-group population that are competing against each other, economically, warfare, in, in cooperation, and democratic governance emerged as basically the most competitive strategy um, uh, in between uh, um, island competition. Just amazing to, 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 uh, to think about this period of uh, human cultural evolution from this multi-level perspective. So there's a great conversation to have. All right, now we're at the point of how do we take these ideas and put them to use to evolve more cooperative societies in the real world at all, um, at all uh, scales. That's what I do mostly now. I still do scholarship a bit, but, uh, but uh, for the most part, I'm trying to implement these ideas in real world settings. My new nonprofit is called Pro Social World, easy to find. Um, we train people to work with groups, regular online trainings, and the next one is uh, coming right up. And so if you're sufficiently motivated to actually get involved with me and my, my um, uh, colleagues, then uh, there's an open door for you right here. Uh, just go to Pro Social World, there'll be a pop-up and, uh, and you can check out these training courses and uh, you can get involved that, um, that uh, uh, quickly. So here are some key points, which I think that if you just you know consider them at face value, they're so obvious that, that they can't be otherwise. We can say that human society is both multi-context and multi-level. Multi-context means that there's many spheres of activity that must be regulated separately and coordinated with each other. We all exist in multiple contexts. Multi-level means that for any given context, we often have groups nested within larger groups. And if you were to actually go and study 
any context at any level, what you would find is that those units vary in how well they function. Some will function spectacularly without needing to be trained. Others will be disasters. And most of us are muddling along in between in our various groups and organizations and and uh, and uh, our processes. Um, much of human society is CAS2 systems, complex systems of agents following their respective adaptive strategies when they need to become CAS1 uh, systems. When it comes to evolving CAS1 systems, two approaches won't work and only one approach can work. One thing that doesn't work, as I've said, is laissez-faire. It's just not the case that we can all pursue our separate interests and that'll turn out for the common good. Centralized planning won't work because the world is too complex for any group of experts to formulate a grand plan. And the only thing that can work is a conscious process of cultural evolution. So we must explicitly choose our targets of selection, orient variation around the target, replicate better practices, realizing that they will often be sensitive to context. That's the degree to which we must manage multi-level cultural evolution. And because this is the only thing that can work, it's the only thing that ever has worked. It's not new. It's what's worked throughout history described in one way or another. People have taken a pragmatic experimental approach to solving their problems. And the tradition of pragmatism, which originated in America in the 19th century, directly inspired by Darwin, and represented by figures such as William James and John Dewey is an example of this pragmatic experimental approach to solving, uh, basically to evolving uh, society, however it is described. But there is a tremendous added value in doing this from a more formal theoretical uh, perspective. So this combination of like, better practices are are all around us. There's good governance practices and there's good change methods all around us, but that we can do still better by recognizing their general features is a, a very important point to, uh, uh, to make. Another key take home is the small group is a fundamental unit of, of social um, organization. This is the ancestral human environment. Against individualism, Throughout our evolutionary history, individuals never lived alone. We always lived as members of highly cooperative groups. And against this background, that being the one constant of our ancestral past, our brains and bodies evolved to seamlessly integrate personal and social resources when making their trade-off decisions. And so we're truly like ants in colonies more than we have thought up to um, now, because this insight has been almost totally obscured by individualism. I'm a wonderful person who studies this, is named Jim Cohen. And here's a TEDx talk called Why We Hold Hands. I encourage you to, um, to uh, view. Jim is a cognitive neuroscientist at the University of Virginia. And he was seeing an old World War II vet who was suffering from late onset post-traumatic stress syndrome. And the old man, wouldn't respond to any kind of therapy, wouldn't do anything that Jim asked him to do, and suddenly said, I want my wife with me. And so Jim had never had this request before, and he said, okay. And at first he treated his wife as a bystander, and the old man was no more receptive than before. And then his wife said, let me hold his hand. And as soon as she held his hand, he became responsive to therapy. And so Jim was amazed and embarked upon a set of experiments with everyday people in which he would put them in an fMRI machine and stress them with a threat of electric shock. And he would do this under three circumstances, alone and holding the hand of a loved one and holding the hand of a stranger. And what he discovered was, was that holding the hand of a loved one had a trem tremendous calming effect on the, on the brain under stress. And so the idea, this is one, one illustration of the idea of how much our brains and bodies are factoring in social resources along with personal resources. Here's another one of my favorite 
examples based on the work of Jim's colleague, um, Dennis Prophet. So imagine you're at the base of this hill and I ask you to estimate its slope, which you do. And I do it under different conditions in which I deplete your personal resources before and after fasting, before and after a workout, with or without a heavy backpack. And what happens here is that, of course, when you deplete your personal resources, you're less interested in climbing the hill. Perceptually, you actually perceive that as the hill being steeper. We're just built that way. And so our desire to climb the hill is reflected in how steep we estimate the slope to be. So against that background, the fourth condition is you, compared to you standing next to a friend, you're not holding hands in this case, but lo and behold, with a friend next to you, that hill just flattens out. You say, let's climb that hill. That's the degree to which your brain and body, without you ever knowing it, completely beneath your conscious awareness, is factoring in your social resources in addition to your personal resources. So this is transformative for therapy and, and, uh, uh, and training. And yet, although I've emphasized the importance of small groups, we also need to emphasize that they need to be appropriately structured because if those groups are structured like the single game of Monopoly, of course, we're not gonna get anything like that. So, and it's here that Eleanor Ostrom comes in. She's a political scientist by training who won the Nobel Prize in 2009. She studied the famous tragedy of the commons, uh, which is that when groups are attempting to manage a natural resource, such as a forest, a field, uh, fisheries, or, uh, or water, then there's always a temptation for members to take more than their share. And so the tragedy of the common was thought to be inevitable. Uh, the only way to solve it is by privatizing the resource or regulating it from above. What she showed by actually studying these groups was that they varied in how well they avoid the tragedy of the commons. And those that were best possess certain core design principles. So it's not the case that small groups always were able to avoid the tragedy of the commons, only some were. And these possess these core design principles, which I will now uh, show you. So the groups that worked had um, a strong sense of identity and purpose. They knew that they were a group. They knew that they, uh, what they were about, who was a member, what was the boundary of the resource, and so on. Uh, there was a fair distribution of costs and benefits. It's not sustainable for some members of the group to get the benefits and others to support the cost. That's unfair by definition. Decision-making was fair and inclusive. Not the case that some people got to make decisions and other people were cut out of the process. In the first place, that's unfair. And in the second place, it doesn't make use of everyone's wisdom. Number four, agreed upon behaviors were monitoring so that you would know when people are doing what they agreed upon to do. Number five, there were graduated sanctions for misbehavior. If you're not doing what you should, something should be done about it, but there's no need to start out harsh or mean. Um, a friendly reminder is typically um, um, enough to keep people in solid citizen mode. And that same book on, on um, indigenous thought actually makes a point of this, that when people do get a little bit crazy and, and try to push others around, then typically after they're punished for it, they're forgiven for it. And then they're welcomed back into the community. That's also true with many religious groups, Christian groups, for example, if you sin, then you're expected to repent and then you're welcomed back into the, into the uh, uh, church. So there's a whole procedure for keeping uh, people in line, which also includes positive reinforcement for good behavior in addition to negative punishment for bad behavior. Conflicts will occur, they need to be resolved quickly and in a manner disregarded as fair by all parties. A group must have the authority to self-govern to do what they are, to do these other things. If they're being bossed around by other groups, then of course all bets are off. And then finally, the relations among groups need to reflect these very same core design principles. So these core design principles are scale independent. And I hope that 
I've told you enough so that you can see how well these core design principles map on to multi-level selection theory. That in a group that implements these core design principles strongly, in the first place, they'll have a strong sense of meaning. CDP one defines the group. CDP two to six will be uh, basically good regulation within the group. And seven and eight will be good regulation of between group interactions. So these are very general. I worked with Eleanor Ostrom. And, uh, and, and what we did together was to show that these principles apply not just to common pool resource groups, but should apply to all forms of cooperation. So our bold prediction is that for any kind of group, you should be able to measure them. They will vary. And that variation will map on to the implementation of the core design principles, just as Eleanor showed for common pool resource groups. And now we're beginning to see how these can be function as a, as a, um, as a, as a practical coaching method. And my very first effort to implement these core design principles, which came very soon after I met Lynn and began working with her, was to work in my city of Binghamton at a school within a school for at-risk high school students. And basically what we did was we created a school that implemented these core design principles. It was a, we were good scientists. It was a randomized control trial. So the students um, to enter this program, they had to have failed at least three of their basic classes during the previous year. We randomly divided them into our school plus a comparison group that experienced the normal school routine. And we monitored quarterly grades, state mandated exams, and a number of non-academic developmental assets. And what we found to our delight and amazement was this tremendous response here that we're seeing for quarterly grades, a comparison of the school, our school, and the comparison group. And not only was there a huge difference, but that difference developed in the first quarter, in the first quarter. And so you have these kids that have had very, very difficult lives and could well have been compromised um, by their life experienced, popping up like a cork. As soon as you provide a social environment, which includes the core design principles, responding within weeks, that's how resilient they were, just waiting for a cooperative social environment. Is that not amazing? And we had other outcomes as well. The, the, the Regents Academy students did as well on the state mandated exams as the average high school student. So this is an incredible validation of the fact that social behaviors need to be, need these core, uh, core design principles. Uh, there's more evidence, but I think that, um, uh, well, no, I think I'm okay. So uh, here's a more recent study. It's a survey study in which we asked participants to um, bring to mind two groups that they know well. One is a business group, a workplace group that they know well. And the other is any other kind of group that they know well. So this is a comparison of business groups with a diversity of other kinds of groups. And we asked them to, to provide information on how well those groups functioned and how well they implemented the core design principles. And what we showed is, is that the core design principles explained the, the uh, implementation of the core design principles explained the functioning of all of the groups. That's the bottom line. All groups need the same core design principles. On average, business groups were deficient on each and every one of them. Each and every one of them, on average, they varied too. And so some business groups functioned well by virtue of implementing the core design principles. On average, they were deficient in each and every one. And the biggest deficits were in CDP7, local autonomy, CDP1, strong sense of identity and purpose, and CDP3, decision-making. Translation, many people in their workplaces are not allowed to do their jobs as they see fit, are not part, do not 
have a strong sense of identity with their workplace and do not take part in the decisions that affect their lives in the in the workplace. That probably sounds familiar to many of you. So how is it possible for there to be this deficit in business groups when you'd think that in a competitive environment, talk about between group competition, business groups should be better, not worse at this. And, and that's a complicated question, but one answer surely is basically the theoretical worldview that we are adopting. So here I'm comparing the so-called shareholder value model, the idea that the only responsibility of a business is to make money for its shareholders. If that's what you're thinking, then you'll structure your business quite differently than if you have the core design principles in mind. And this brings us back now to our dual inheritance theory. If we think of the symbol type as the shareholder value model compared to Eleanor Ostrom's core design principles, of course that's going to influence the phenotype of your group dramatically. So it depends on how we how we think about uh, things. Okay, so now I'm going to, I've introduced you to um, one part of our practical change method, the core design principles. And now I'm going to introduce you to a second component, which is based on a cluster of disciplines called contextual behavioral science. These are the more or less the applied behavior science um, um, disciplines, and especially a form of mindfulness-based therapy called acceptance and commitment training, uh, founded by this man here, Stephen C. Hayes. Um, and his most recent book is titled A Liberated Mind, How to Pivot Towards What Matters. And increasingly, Steve and his colleagues are thinking of therapy and training which of course is all dedicated to changing individuals and, and uh, uh, groups as a form of managed evolution, personal evolution in the case of individuals, group level and evolution in the case of, of groups. And so framing it this way, we can say that each of us is to a large extent an evolutionary process. We are selected by consequences, as B.F. Skinner put it, then some things are rewarding in our environments, others are punishing, and we just basically were plastic enough to respond, just like an evolving population. Uh, but just like genetic evolution, as we've seen, when it's not managed, it often takes us where we don't want to go. We behave in ways that are adaptive in some sense, in some sense, but not in the pursuit of our long-term uh, interest. Evolution doesn't make everything nice. If we merely respond to our environment, we'll behave in ways that we could recognize as adaptive, but not in a way that leads to our thriving of ourselves or others over the long term. We might want a, a, a great relationship with our partner, for example, but we might also want to seek to control them. And so there you get the kind of tension that we're talking about. And so we can see therapy and training as a form of aligning our personal evolution with our normative goals. Now, this form of therapy is amazingly evidence-based. This is an old slide. Actually, there's almost 600 randomized control trials to date demonstrating the efficacy of this way of managing our personal um, evolution for a whole panoply of disorders here. Some of these are associated with therapy such as psychosis or, uh, or um, epilepsy, um, anxiety disorders, and so on. Others are associated with training, such as sports performance and academic uh, uh, performance. Either way, this can be helpful in, in uh, managing our personal uh, evolution. Here's just one example I want to tell you about in a little more detail. This is a study of public school teachers who were basically experiencing burnout. 75% um, were above clinical cutoffs for general mental health, depression, anxiety, and stress. It's a well-designed study, wait list, randomized treatment. What that means is that we recruit people to the study. We divide them at random into two groups. One group does the treatment first. The other group has a waiting period, and then they do the treatment. What's the treatment? It's to read a book, no, not see a therapist at all. Merely read 
one of Steve's books on acceptance and commitment training, work through the exercises. And what we see here is that here's the first group that reads it. They're scoring better. There's the second group, there's the waiting period, no difference, no statistical difference. Now they read the book, they get better. But what I love best about this graph is here, the difference between here and here. This is the difference between post and follow up. So here they read the book and they got better. Then nothing else happened. They could have stayed the same. They could have relapsed, but they had internalized something. They changed their symbotype basically. And now they were practicing and on their own, they got still better during that period. That's the extent to which therapy and training can actually succeed at changing our symbolic systems in order to improve our, our well-being just by reading a book. Reading a book had about one third the effect of actually seeing a, um, act, uh, a therapist. And so here's um, a very brief introduction to the method of what ACT is. It's a, uh, it's called the matrix. So it's divided into four quadrants. And on the upper half is our inner thoughts and feelings, what people cannot see. And in evolutionary terms, that corresponds to our symbotype, our symbolic system is on the top half of this uh, space. On the bottom half is our phenotype. It's what we can see, our outer actions. And so the distinction between our symbotype and our phenotype is being nicely captured by this, um, by this uh, image, which was developed without respect to um, evolution, by, by the way. Now on the right, we have our thoughts and actions that take us towards our valued goal. And on our left, we have our thoughts and actions that take us away from our valued goals. And what the training consists of is basically a reflection in these four quadrants. And we can begin up here in our minds as to what's valuable to us, what's important to us. So let's say this was, this was being done by a group. And so the group members would get together and they would specify, why is this group important? Why is it worth being in this group? And so, and of course, this will help to build up the group's sense of identity and purpose. Then you ask the question, okay, based on these positive values, how would we actually behave in the world to bring these things about? So we go into the, the action part of this space and we list what we should actually be doing in order to bring about these, these um, objectives. And that basically becomes the target of selecting. We're gonna select four of these behaviors. Now we move up here and we ask, isn't it curious that despite the fact that this group is important to us, then we still think in ways and feel in ways that often are counterproductive with respect to what we're trying to do in this group. So let's not ignore those, let's explore those and let's explore how they lead to behaviors that take us away from our valued goals. And now that we see the whole matrix, we can now accept the existence of what's on the left side and we can commit to working around them in order to stay on the right side of the matrix. And if we help each other do that as members of a group, then we'll be more successful than if we just try to do that as an individual, although that can be successful too. So there's just a taste of how this works and it can work very fast. Some of the literature on this, one paper I read recently actually was a was called a micro intervention. It was 15 minutes of trainings for couples um, on using this kind of approach, 15 minutes, and then monitored their behavior towards each other and also playing experimental economics games such as uh, the uh, ultimatum game and, and so on and showing an effect of 15 minutes of training on the actual behavior of these, uh, of these uh, uh, couples, quite uh, amazing. All right, well, at the risk of overwhelming you, I am now close to the end of my talk and I did wanna to return to where I began which is my meeting with His Holiness and the spiritual um, uh, uh, dimension. A lot of what I said 
can be said without any reference to spirituality. When we're talking as economists or as social scientists or as evolutionary biologists, we can just be speaking about this in purely secular terms without having a spiritual bone in our body. And so, and yet at the same time, it's the very same conversation that is being had um, in the spiritual community. And so we can ask, what is, if anything, does this uh, spirituality, uh, what we associate with spirituality, add to conscious uh, cultural evolution? And I think the answer is, once again, the kind of symbotype that's created by spiritual training and practice. Well, what is the inner transformation? And of course, that's how it's described. It's an attempt at an inner transformation which turns you into a compassionate human being. Buddhism is all about abandoning a narrow concept of self, uh, recognizing uh, the interdependence of all things and thinking more systemically. That's that's what it is. And cultivating a state of mind, this is true for most spiritual and religious training in which you think of yourself as part of something larger than yourself, something that you regard as sacred, which means that which means that you place it above you. You behave according to its dictates. You want to serve it. It is the suppression of your individual desires in the service of a higher good. That's what spiritual training and practice is all about. And of, of course, you can see how this would be a symbotype that is exceptionally conducive for compassionate action. And yet, one of the main messages I had for His Holiness is that inner transformation is not enough. It, you cannot just get people to feel and think compassionately and then expect them to act compassionately, especially in a Darwinian world where there are other people that are not going to behave that way. And so there has to be an outer transformation, a social, trans social organizational transformation, for example, by implementing those core design principles in the, uh, in the groups that we work with at all scales, which are protective, provide a safe and protective social environment for uh, compassionate behaviors to thrive. Because if you don't do that, if you don't provide those special conditions, then if you get someone to behave compassionately, you're actually disadvantaging them in the real world. And that's not something that we want to do. And so there has to be an outer social organizational transformation that is accompanied by the inner transformation was one of my main messages to His Holiness and to, and to you. And so here's a summary. Um, the concepts of conscious evolution in society as an organism have deep historical roots. Only now, for the first time in the history of ideas, have they been placed on a solid scientific foundation. Most of the relevant developments have taken place within the last few decades, still largely unknown to most people. Our great potential for evolving the future across multiple contexts and scales, and we are building a practical framework for anyone to become involved. And so, thank you very much. Well, David, thank you very much. That was a, a fascinating talk. Uh, there was a lot in there. Um, I don't know if people have been overwhelmed or if uh, if it's landed, but no, it was a, it was a really powerful presentation. Um, so I'm going to ask the first question here from Fatima. And Fatima asks, does this approach or model bring both collectivism and individualism together, or is it completely advocating uh, collectivism? Uh, that is a great question, um, Fatima, and let me elaborate on it in some um, in some detail. It um, it brings both in, and the great thing about um, about um, this hunter gatherer mentality is that there's a very strong 
individualistic component in addition to a collective component because the great challenge is to avoid being bullied and pushed around. That means individual and hunter-gatherer societies, they stand up for themselves. They say, you cannot push me around. I'm not going to do what you want me to do. We're going to do what we agree to do. And so the individual participation and the individual ability to resist domination is a very important uh, um, a part of this. So it really combines the best of individualism and collectivism. And then there's another axis of variation, which is not exactly the same. And this is based on the work of my good friend, who's also a um, on the board of directors of Pro Social World, Michel Gelfand, who makes a distinction between not individualistic and collective, but what she calls tight and loose. A tight culture is one that has very strong norms that are enforced by strong punishments. A, a loose culture is one which allows much more flexibility for how their members behave and are um, more lax on on um, on punishment. So, uh, so Germany, for example, is a tight culture, and America is a loose uh, culture. Sweden is a tight culture. Brazil is a loose, and Italy are loose cultures. Korea is a tight culture. And so this axis from tight to loose maps on to different ecological environments. The greater the collective threat, then the tighter the culture becomes because there's a great need for collective. You can't do just anything you want. And, and this is reflected among other things in the response to the, to the uh, COVID pandemic. If you look to how the various nations responded, they map, although in quite a complicated way, onto, I mean, there was a need for collective action and, um, and the response was extremely, extremely variable. So uh, Michelle will tell you that what we need to do in, in the different context of our lives, back to context, is that there's some contexts that call for tightness, others call for lo looseness, creativity, and so on. And we need to be sufficiently flexible. She calls it ambidextrous, so that we actually behave with the appropriate degree of tightness and looseness for the situation. That's how context sensitive we must, we must be. So a uh, great question. And, uh, and I highly recommend the work of uh, Michelle Gelfin. I'll type it in here. Uh, and uh, Niall, you should definitely get her to be one of your next. Uh, I, will, I will check it right. Michelle Gelfin. Michelle Gelfin. Her book is called Tight, A Rule Makers, Rule Breakers. Um, David, whenever you move, I think you've got a pen or something. Whenever you're moving some paper or pens there, it's making, it's disrupting the audio. So just try and be okay. conscious of that. Actually, that's probably my lapel mic. Let me just move it on so that it's not I'm rushing against my shirt. Oh, that is what it is. See if that's an improvement. Yeah, I, I can't hear it now. So that seems to be a bit better. Um, Something that came to mind there whenever you were speaking was, I remember reading Evolution for Everyone. That's uh, one of David's earlier books, by the way. And there was a story in it about a tribe, a current hunter-gatherer tribe, maybe somewhere in Africa or South America, I'm not sure. But what happens in this tribe is that whenever somebody, a young man goes out and gets a big kill in a hunt and he brings it back to the tribe, elder mem members of the tribe will actually um, sort of uh what's the word they'll sort of like poke fun at him and say oh you've only brought back a tiny little yeah. little animal <laughs> today or whatever can you explain why why that happens and the the significance of that well it goes back to the my my uh excerpt from sand talk that uh there's great need to to suppress um individuals from just playing the single game of monopoly and so if you have for example you know, let's say that in a group, there's one person who's a better hunter. They're just a better hunter. Um, and so is this going to give them some kind of special status and they're going to start, you know, pushing themselves around and stuff like that? And so uh, there's a, um, a leveling that takes place to make sure that that doesn't happen. And often it takes place through humor. Humor is huge here that we can, I mean, so much, so many important things get accomplished through humor in our own lives. 
in addition to um, hunter-gatherer lives. And if somebody is being too self-important, we cut them down to size. And typically we do it through jokes, right? That's very familiar to us. And so that's what takes place here. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a famous article, it's old now, so it's not famous anymore, but it was by an anthropologist who was working with Bushmen, African Bushmen, and he was about to leave and he wanted to have a big celebration. And so he got the biggest, fattest cow that he could find for there to be a final feast. And he was just shocked when everyone was denigrating this cow about how skinny it was and, and how could he be so stingy as to get them this cow and, and, and stuff like that. And, you know, he finally had dawned upon him why, why this was, uh, why this was taking place. But I think that, uh, I'll bet that many of your people in our audience here have had that experience. I certainly do. Um, is that uh, is that uh, you know nobody is better. Even the even the the, you know, the most important people in a group is uh, should not regard themselves as better. We are all moral equals. We are all moral equals from the best from the from the strongest to the to the weakest. That's very very important. And it's embedded in our own morality. It's why we have attitudes we do towards the handicapped and and so on. I mean, even abortion, I think you can see as as attitudes against abortion as 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 a way to protect the weak um, uh, is uh, is part of this uh, part of this uh, uh, impulse. So it's it's very deeply a part of. Uh, of morality. And then I'm going to pick up on Josie Walters. I see, do you think this approach is possible without empathy? Um, I think, no, it's not possible without empathy, but the, but the, but the, the important thing is to appreciate how the empathetic side of human nature and morality, basically the voluntary side, the, 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 the voluntary impulse to help others on the basis of their, uh, uh, on the basis of their needs, motivated by emotions such as empathy and sympathy and love and friendship and so on and so forth, requires the compulsory component. If you don't have the compulsory component of holding people accountable for what we do, then then empathy is just too vulnerable. That's the thing, love, empathy, compassion. It causes you to be vulnerable. And unless there's the compulsory side of moral systems, then that vulnerability is something nobody should be expected to, to do. And so what you find, and by the way, I find this in my own experience, working with groups and implementing these core design principles. You look at those core design principles and there's very little that looks altruistic in them. There's no really mention of empathy or love or, or any of that. It's all about like, you know, um, um, protections. And yet when you implement those core design principles and you've created a trustworthy social environment, it's trustworthy not because the members are trustworthy as individuals, we hope for that too. But even if members were not trustworthy, the social organization would take care of that for you. And when people are placed in that social environment and they realize that it's safe for them to be pro-social, which is what they probably want to do to extend themselves, then that results in an upwelling of good feelings, good feelings and, and, and empathy and love. And, and I mean, people describe themselves as family, for example. Members of groups decide, describe themselves as like, like family because of those protections. I think that's not so obvious. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's very compelling, but not so obvious that these two sides of morality, the compulsory side and the voluntary side, need to go together. 100%. I've been involved in sports teams throughout my life where there have been some where I have felt sort of safe and I felt sort of uh, the environment was a positive environment where you could sort of try things and take risks and it was safe to do that. And I've been involved in other sports teams where if you took a risk and made a mistake, you would be heavily sort of like uh, sort of browbeaten by the rest of the team. And it's just it's it's a completely different experience to be involved in those two two different teams. So I can sort of see maybe a little bit about what you're getting at here. 
Um, so we've got one here from Rhiannon. You spoke about the three core design principles. Um, for example, authority to self-govern, uh, the companies are said to be lacking in one of the studies. What are some ways that companies can address these in the real world? In the first place, I want to say that uh, that both business groups and other kinds of groups uh, varied. It was only an average difference. And so if you look at business groups, you will find uh, many, really, that actually do implement these core design principles and, and um, and um, and function well for that for that uh, reason. And the two answers I would give is first of all awareness, because you know really taking the idea of symbotype seriously. I mean, our symbolic systems just truly govern how we see and interpret the world. And if you have, for example, the shareholder value model, then you will simply see the world differently. It will govern what you do. And it will end up in compromising the core design principle. So just communicating the core design principle, showing that they work, we get people say, okay, maybe we should do it this way. Well, good for you. It's likely to work. And you'll you'll see see an improvement. But the second answer, and I um it is indeed Pierre Tiel, uh, Tehard de Chardin, folks, and I'll I'll get to that in just a minute. If Niall steer me towards that question after this one. Um the um the uh, uh, the reason the, the the core design principles are not implemented is often because there are strong opposing forces. In other words, in groups and especially in business groups, because there are huge power asymmetries, the elite members of the group are running it for their benefit and they don't want to change it. People playing the single game of monopoly do not necessarily go lightly into the night. And so there's that. And so this is basically power struggles and the need for uh, to implement the appropriate controls so that we can get this accountability and so on. So it's a tough fight. People that um, are really are, uh, I'm going to say something and then I'm going to change immediately. Um, are in it for themselves and are not going to easily give up. But the, the second thing I'm going to say is that so often when you look at groups that are not working well, everyone in the group is actually well intentioned. So it's not just a matter of intentions, it's not just a matter of getting everyone in the group to be kind of team oriented or or something like that, they can still trip over each other. For example, you might well get somebody that's so, so into the group that they just want to have their way and they want their opinion to be, you know, they want to dominate things. They want to be the stage manager. That happens all, all the time. And so I think, you know, when your you're discussion of teams, then is we could have people going about that. But if it's a, you know, a top-down manager that's just forcing people to do things their way as being harsh and judgmental, so on and so forth, that person might be out for their team just as much as anyone else, but they're still just not implementing the core, core design principles. So intentions, of course you need to have good intentions, but that's, that's, that's um, not sufficient. Even when you have good intentions, it's possible for groups to function uh, poorly. 100%. Okay, so I'm going to bring you back to this question. I think it was from Bradley. Um, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human human experience. Would you agree? And then maybe we could talk about the work of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin here as well. Yeah, so Chardin was um, both a scientist and a Jesuit priest. Uh, he wrote in the 1930s, but he, he wasn't published until the 1950s. His most famous book is called The Phenomenon of Man. A new edition has been published called The Human Phenomenon, which is evidently a better uh, translation. And um, I mean, he has basically got a whole lot right. So if you know about Tehard and if you appreciate his message, then uh, a lot of what I'm talking about is uh, is an updating of Tehard de Chardin. And my book, This View of Life, begins and ends with Tehard. And I sometimes even describe myself as the modern 
incarnation of, of Tehard. And there's a family foundation that I'm working with called the Human Energy Project, headed by a man named Ben Casera. Uh, let me just say a word about him because he's so interesting. He was uh, actually born in Iraq, Iraq, Mosul, uh, but was part of the Christian minority. And he was educated by Jesuits, American Jesuits. And he gra gravitated towards science and engineering, had a crisis of faith with his Christian religion, went to one of his Jesuit professors. And that person said, do you know about Teilhard de Chardin? So Ben started to read Teilhard and that acted as a kind of a bridge for him to go from his Christian religion to a more science-based world view. And after he succeeded as an engineer, he started a family foundation, and now he basically wants to, to make Tehard's ideas more better known and, and to update them scientifically, and that's what I'm doing. So um, um, I, we, we can provide notes, Niall. Uh, you could look up the Human Energy Project, and you can get there. And we're actually doing lots of content updating a uh, 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 uh the Chardin. So uh, he is, um, and, and that updating is very, very possible. And so he was both so spiritual and so scientific. That's possible. And that's really what we are striving, striving for. Yeah, definitely. We'll send an email out tomorrow, tomorrow morning with like all the sort of things mentioned and links and stuff for, for follow-ups. Um, so just a more general question, David, what would you say to someone listening to this? What are the benefits of taking this idea seriously, both on an individual level and on a collective level of really sort of coming to grasp with evolutionary theory? Like what can someone benefit from, how can that benefit their life? Well, when you begin with the idea that from genetic evolution, in my talk, I said that this toolkit or this this basically the theory that has proven itself for the for the um, subject of genetic evolution can now be applied to our personal and cultural evolution. That's something I said. And one of the insights from genetic evolution is that evolution doesn't make everything nice. Evolution results in outcomes that often benefit me, not you, us, not them, or our short-term welfare, as opposed to our long-term welfare. Now, when we apply that to our personal and cultural evolution, we can conclude that just um, it doesn't make everything nice. That even though we're responding to evolutionary forces which define who we are, it's often not contributing to our long-term happiness, even either as individuals or as groups or larger uh, societies. So if we're not happy, if we're not functioning well, it's likely that there's nothing organically wrong with us. We're not sick in that way. It's just that evolution, evolutionary pressures took us someplace that we don't wanna be. And so in order to improve, it's a matter of then once again, managing these selection pressures that are molding who we uh, are. To give you a concrete example, I mean, all, many families are locked into a kind of a co-evolutionary race to the bottom. If I'm in an unpleasant familial relationship and you're trying to get me to do something I don't want to do and so I turn nasty. If I'm a kid, I have, I have a tantrum. If I'm a parent, I hit you. Um, I, we're all just you know forcing to, to get our ways. Each step on that downward spiral is reinforcing. And I'm agnostic, when I'm obnoxious and I get my way, I have been reinforced for that behavior. And so you have to be able to take that negative spiral and turn it into a positive spiral. It's possible. There's methods for doing it, but it's a, it's a mindful process. It's not going to happen necessarily by itself. And so the idea that most of our problems are not organic dysfunctions, isn't that nice to know? It's not a disease in that way. It's simply that uh, that evolutionary processes have not led to 
benign outcomes, but they can be made so. So it basically this provides a whole new, and again, I'm, I'm careful to stress it's not totally new because there's been convergence upon these, these ideas, but there is an added value in seeing their, their uh, 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 generality. And what I've said goes at all scales. Um, um, I think, uh, our, well, I'll come back to something uh, now. You probably have more questions, but uh, but just so there's my best answer to that to that question. Okay, okay, great. Um, I can't see any current in the chat, so I've I've got one. Um, am I right? Am I, am I right in saying that you're an atheist, David? Yes. Well, actually, I have to. Um, I mean, the superficial answer is yes, but then there's a longer answer that's no. So. Um, okay. <laughs> So, um, well, my question sort of centers around this idea of evolutionary theory as a meaning system. And do you think this, you can live a meaningful life without um, leaving the grounds of uh, scientific, uh, scientific reality? And you've sort of done some work, I think, on the kind of, most important elements of meaning systems and maybe if you could tell us a bit more about that i think people would be interested to hear that if you if you could so there's two definitions of religion that are incompatible with each other isn't that amazing one definition has to do with belief in supernatural agents we all know that one right if you believe in gods then you're religious uh, the other is Durkheim's definition, which is basically a, a, a set of beliefs and practices organized around the concept of the sacred, which unite into one moral community called a church, all who adhere to them. Okay, so it's a focus on the concept of the sacred. Never says a word about supernatural agents. It's, it concentrates on the idea of the sacred, a moral community, uh, that sort of that sort of thing, and so. If you can, if you're religious according to Durkheim's definition, but you're but you're functioning in scientific mode, then I could call myself religious. And I mean, you could even um, um, endorse some selection, some some conceptions of God. If God, for example, is is Gaia, the whole Earth is an organism. Uh, that's something bigger than. Uh, ourselves and it doesn't exist in it at present but it could be brought into being and the idea that 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 a god is something which doesn't exist but needs to be brought into being with human effort that's not a new idea that's 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 a that's a conception of of god one of the conversations i recently had was with uh on on Teilhard de chardin is with a a sister a dominican sister named elia delio who is a very widely read and well known uh, Catholic sister, and very much a proponent of Teilhard, very much a kind of modern proponent of of Teilhard, and she calls it process theology. Teilhard himself, despite his Catholic background, his the spiritual system that he created did not rely on any supernatural agency, not any anywhere. No divine spark was needed to describe what he was talking about and yet he regarded it as a metamorphosis of the catholic religion and so does Ilya delio so her from her background and for me as a scientist we got along just fine so the bottom line is is that uh, is that we need a meaning system which is strongly religious according to durkheim's definition and that includes a very strong sense of the sacred there's things that are more important than us and we need to bring those things about. And the community needs to be a worldwide community. That's the sense in which I can call myself religious and a believer in some aspects of, of God. But for me, it has to be squarely within the boundary of methodological naturalism. So no supernatural agency anywhere. Thank you very much. So so that's that's the form of religion that I I can I can sign on to. Fantastic. Okay. Um, 
We've got one here from Bradley. Um, so Bruce Alexander posited the idea of hypercapitalism as a major problem in what he called the felt dislocation of peoples around the world. Could it be that hypercapitalism is our modern day enemy rather than capitalism itself, as posited by Alexander in the globalization of addiction, that hypercapitalism causes dislocation and anomie? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Bradley, because there are benign forms of capitalism, uh, very benign forms. And what we're reaching for, if you look at the nations that function well, the best, and there's a whole political science literature on why nations succeed and fail, including the book, Why Nations Fail by Darren S. Amoglu and, and um, uh, Robinson. Um, and the, the best functioning nations are very strong market economies. They're capitalistic economy. They're the Nordic countries, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, uh, Switzerland, Netherlands, even Japan. Um, the, so, the, the nations that are explicitly socialistic are disasters. And, and they're disasters for two reasons. One is uh, centralized planning, which doesn't work. The world is too complex. Societies are too complex that you form some kind of five-year plan and then um, execute it. That will never, ever work. You need something more responsive like market processes in order for societies to run. And also socialist nations end up concentrating power in the hands of elites, and that never works. And that, that always results in, even the, even the socialistic movements that start out well-meaning, their leaders were genuinely well-meaning, they go bad because of, the, because of selection by consequences. Once a small group of elites are making all the decisions, then power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So every socialistic experiment, which did away with capitalism altogether, has been an abject failure. So there's there's forms of capitalism that are great. And yet, of course, there's other forms that are not at all great, and we can call those hyper-capitalism, and then we have to avoid that too. So, so basically, there's two ways to fail. One is too much laissez-faire, and the other is too much centralized planning. And then there's this third way, as I sometimes call it, which is this carefully managed process of cultural evolution, which involves um, free markets of the right variety. So, so, uh, so yeah, we don't want to be just naively um, against, uh, against uh, capitalism about this. David's colleague, uh, Anthony Biglin, has actually written some work on this. Uh, his new book's called Rebooting Capitalism. So, yeah. If yeah. anyone's interested, that might be worth worth a look. Um, David, one more question before you go. Um, you've done, you've written a book on altruism. You've studied it in depth. I'm just curious, you know, what's your, how do you look at altruism? What's your definition of it? And how do you approach it in your own life? Well, I prefer the word pro-social to altruism. Altruism in many people's minds um, includes a, a, an element of self-sacrifice. So you're not you're not altruistic unless it's costly for you to do it. And pro-social is basically other oriented. Pro-social is anything that's oriented towards the welfare of others um, and society as a as a as a whole. And hopefully I can benefit along with everyone else in my pro-social efforts. I'm trying to create a society that works for all. That includes me. So uh, so there's an important difference between pro-social and and um, um, altruism. Um, and I think that very simply, once you begin to think about prosociality from, from an evolutionary perspective, you realize that it can succeed as an evolutionary strategy. We can do well by doing good. And that's what I'm all about. So I'm about being prosocial and making that successful. Um, around the world, so that, um, and I find it's uh, enormously uh, rewarding. I don't see it as sacrifice at, uh, um, um, at all. So I think that's one of the benefits of approaching this from an evolutionary uh, perspective. You can, in the first place, take that on as your own persona, be a pro-social 
person and you can do it in such a smart way that um, you thrive along with uh, with um, the others. So uh, so that's that's how I would respond. Um, yeah, it reminds me of uh, what you've said. That reminds me of Adam Grant's work on uh, give and take. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you've actually had a. I'm going to link it in the in the chat. You've had a, an interview with him where you sort of touch touching some of these ideas. Um, yeah. I think that's on your your podcast. Um, because just so, to uh, just to because uh, it gets back to the one of the other questions about businesses. What Adam Grant says is, you know, when to givers and takers, givers, takers, and matchers are his three social types. And uh, he asked, when do, uh, who does best in the workplace and uh, in business? And the surprising answer is uh, the givers do the best and the worst. The givers do the best when they get together with other givers, that's spectacular. And they do the worst when they're surrounded by takers. And so that's the dynamic of altruism and selfishness, pro-sociality and, and so on. That's the eternal contest between pro-social behaviors and their alternatives in a nutshell. And pro-sociality can succeed in the workplace. You bet it can. Um, and so let's make sure that that happens more. 100%. Well, that's that's all we've got time for today, David. Um, I think people have got loads from that. So thank you so much for, for sharing your, your lifetime worth, worth of knowledge with us today. I really appreciate it. Before, um, before we end, is there anywhere you'd like to send people online? Any sort of... Um, like final parting words you'd like to offer people, anything like that? Well, if I encourage people to actually get involved in the, in the huge ecosystem we're trying to create. So check out ProSocial World and, and consider taking a training course. You could be interacting with other people in a really deep way if, you're, if you want to implement this in your life, that's what to do. So, and um, this is starting up soon and then uh, at the beginning, you mentioned my novel, Atlas Hugged, and so if you like fiction, and if you like to imbibe some of this in, a, in, in the form of a story, then um, Atlas Hugged. Um, Atlashugged.world is the website. It's being gifted, not sold. So actually, I'm giving it to you. And if you'd like to give something in return, that goes to ProSocial World. Um, yeah. I've I've read Atlas Hugged. It's a great novel, especially if you're if you're sort of just getting into the the world of, of evolution. It, it's it's a very accessible introduction and weaved in with a with a very interesting narrative too. So, David, thanks a million, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And we'll talk okay. soon. That's true for everyone else. Thanks, everyone. Everyone else, we're back at three thirty p.m. UK time for our final final session with uh, Professor Mark Solms.